Thank you. So good morning again, good afternoon and good evening, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to warmly welcome you to session five of the Africa Regional Review Meeting on the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action on Enhancing External Trade for African LDCs, Infrastructure Development, and the Role of Regional Integration. My name is uh, Giovanni Biha. I'm the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel in the UN's Office for West Africa and the Sahel. I will be the moderator for this session, and it's a great pleasure to be with you today. In order to have the meeting run as smoothly as possible in this virtual format, we have a few housekeeping rules. First, if you are a panelist in this session, I kindly request that you keep your video on and your microphone muted while you are not speaking. Second, if you are not part of the panel, please keep your video off and your microphone muted. Third, in order to ensure that everyone has the chance to speak, please keep the time to the time allocated to you and wrap up if you are requested to do so. And finally, please feel free to engage in the chat, but if you have specific questions you would like to be reviewed for response, please ask them in the Q&A option. Ladies and gentlemen, international trade is recognized as an engine for inclusive economic growth and poverty reduction and an important means to achieve the sustainable development goals. Integrating the African LDCs into international trade is therefore fundamental in ensuring that these countries are not left behind in achieving the SDGs. Agenda 2063 also aims to significantly increase trade amongst African countries and strengthen Africa's place in global trade. In this session, we'll review the participation of African LDCs in international trade, discuss the factors that may explain the current performance. We will also explore opportunities for enhancing their trade performance, as well as opportunities for using trade for post-COVID-19 recovery. The session will explore how the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can boost regional and global trade of African LDCs. The session will also look into the role of multilateral trading system in scaling up the trade competitiveness of the African LDCs. We will also explore the role of the private sector. We'll discuss how the competitiveness of African LDCs can be enhanced, including through infrastructure connectivity and aid for trade support. To discuss these issues, we have with us an array of distinguished speakers. Allow me on my own behalf and on behalf of the organizers of the meeting, thank them for agreeing to participate and contribute to this very important meeting. Each of the speakers is given up to five minutes to make a presentation with an exception of Honorable Minister, who is allocated seven minutes, seven minutes to deliver his remarks. Given the time constraints of the meeting and the number of speakers we have during this session, I encourage each speaker to abide by the time limit. We have provided time for interactive discussions after the presentations. I would encourage you to make the most of the opportunity to interact and engage with our speakers. With the permission of the speakers, the, the presentations will be posted on the UN OHRLLS website to facilitate the dissemination of the information presented to delegations that could not attend this event. So I will present you our distinguished panel as follows. Honorable Dr. Tabiso Paul Molapo, 
Minister of Trade and Industry, Lesotho. Ms. Isabel Durand, Acting Secretary General, and TAD. Mr. Ramnaka Adhikari, Executive Director, Enhanced Integrated Framework. Dr. Towela Nirenda Jere, Head of the Economic Integration, AUD NEPAD. Ms. Emily Mburu Ndoria, Director of Trade in Services and IP, African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Mr. Tofkir, Tofkir Rahman, Head LDC Unit, Development Division, WTO. And Ms. Louise Wigget, Chief Executive Officer, Global Trade Solution. We also have Honorable uh, Mr. Sosten Wengwe, Minister of Trade and Member of Parliament for Malawi, as the lead discussant for this session. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our distinguished uh, panelists. And I see that we have all of them on our screen. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Honorable Dr. Tabiso Paul Molapo, Minister of Trade and Industry, Lesotho. Dr. Molapo, we share Lesotho's experience in participating in international trade and the role of international trade in driving Lesotho's national development and divorce. He will also share the challenges faced by his country, lessons learned and best practices to further integrate into regional and global trade. Dr. Molapo, the floor is yours. Dr. Dr. Molapo, are you with us? I don't see Dr. Molapo on the screen. Um, colleagues uh, and dear panelists, let's give just uh, about um, Dr. Uh, Molapo, one or two minutes. But I don't see him on the, um, on the screen. So um, since we don't have uh, Dr. Uh, Molapo, while waiting uh, uh, for him, I would actually uh, maybe give the floor uh, to um, my uh, dear colleague, uh, Miss uh, uh, Durand, Isabelle Durand. So you will be our first uh, speaker, uh, Isabelle Durand, who is Acting Secretary General of ANTAT. Uh, to give her remarks. So Ms. Durand will highlight progress uh, so far achieved by LLDCs toward achieving target 1711 of the SDGs of doubling the LDC's share of global exports by 2020. She will highlight the actions that should be taken at national, regional, and uh, global levels to maximize the trade potential of African LDCs. She will also highlight how trade may be leveraged to deal with COVID-19 and in achieving resilient recovery. Um, Isabel, you have the floor and it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Giovanna. And um, I will speak in French. I think we have, uh, yes, I think we have translation. Uh, translation. Yeah. translation. Yes, thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs, um, c'est vrai, au-delà des chiffres, le commerce est toujours une histoire de possibilités et d'opportunités. 
mais nous devons admettre que jusqu'à présent, il n'a pas vraiment répondu aux espoirs et aux attentes des nations africaines. Quand la CNUSET a été créée il y a près de 60 ans, la part de l'Afrique dans le commerce mondial était de 5,7%. Aujourd'hui, elle n'est plus que de 2,5%. Et pour les pays les moins avancés, l'histoire n'est pas non plus une réussite. Il y a dix ans, dans le cadre de la, la conférence PMA 4, le monde a convenu d'aider ces nations pour doubler leur part du commerce mondial. Mais leur part n'a pas beaucoup bougé et elle stagne seulement à 1%. Alors ces mauvais chiffres ne sont pas une raison pour abandonner ou pour céder au pessimisme, évidemment que non, parce que, comme ça a été dit, L'accord de libre-échange continental africain est évidemment un jalon important et même historique pour l'Afrique et ses pays les moins avancés. Il ouvre des possibilités et de relever des défis structurels et commerciaux du continent et c'est surtout une occasion de stimuler le commerce intra-africain et de progresser vers la réalisation des ODD et de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine. Actuellement, plus de 80% des PMA sont considérés comme dépendants des produits de base et la majeure partie de leurs exportations sont des produits primaires. Seuls 6% des exportations des PMA africains vers l'extérieur du continent sont des produits manufacturés. Pour le commerce intra-africain, la part des produits manufacturés dans les exportations est un peu plus élevée, environ 30%. Ça montre donc que le continent peut servir de destination pour la production à plus forte valeur ajoutée des PMA africains. Mais le problème est que les destinations intra-africaines absorbent à peine 17% des exportations totales des PMA africains. Par conséquent, la possibilité de bénéficier d'exportations plus sophistiquées, plus complexes vers les marchés régionaux est assez limitée. L'accord de libre-échange est donc une opportunité pour une plus grande diversification en promouvant l'engagement dans des activités économiques plus complexes et pour améliorer les capacités productives afin de rivaliser et de participer aux chaînes de valeur régionales et mondiales. Mais pour ce faire, deux conditions doivent être remplies. La première, c'est que les PMA africains doivent développer de nouvelles capacités productives et évidemment renforcer ce qu celles qui existent déjà. Ça doit permettre la modernisation de l'agriculture et des services agricoles et l'engagement dans de nouvelles activités à plus forte valeur ajoutée et à plus forte productivité du travail. À l'heure actuelle, en effet, les capacités productives des PMA africains sont inférieures de 30% à celles des autres pays en développement, selon notre indice des capacités productives. Les PMA ont donc pris du retard, et en particulier dans deux domaines, tous les deux liés aux infrastructures, celui des technologies de l'information et de la communication, hein, dit les TIC, et euh, celui des transports et de l'énergie. Dans le domaine des TIC, les pays moins avancés africains se classent jusqu'à 56 en dessous des autres pays en développement, ce qui évidemment limite leur accès à la technologie et à l'information, ou à une communication fluide avec les fournisseurs et les clients. Elle empêche également les entreprises de bénéficier des derniers développements technologiques et d'exploiter le potentiel du commerce électronique. Le commerce électronique connaissait déjà une croissance rapide avant le Covid, mais évidemment la crise a accéléré de façon fulgurante son usage et a ainsi mis en lumière l'importance cruciale de disposer d'infrastructures de compétences et de politiques numériques adéquates. Une infrastructure énergétique et de transport est également défaillante ou insuffisante et ça ne constitue pas seulement un frein au commerce électronique. Plus généralement, le fait d'avoir une faible infrastructure énergétique et de transport a pour effet de ralentir les activités des entreprises, d'augmenter leurs coûts de production, ce qui évidemment affecte négativement leur compétitivité sur les marchés nationaux et internationaux. Il est un fait que plus de 40% des entreprises des PMA identifient l'accès insuffisant à une électricité fiable comme une contrainte majeure à leur développement. L'insuffisance des infrastructures de transport, quant à elle, empêche une distribution efficace des marchandises dans la région 
c'est donc un double handicap. Ainsi, pour bénéficier de la zone de libre-échange, une priorité pour les PME africains, c'est vraiment d'accélérer les investissements dans différents types d'infrastructures et de favoriser le développement de leurs capacités de production. Ça, c'était la première condition. La deuxième condition pour récolter les bénéfices de l'intégration régionale, c'est de s'assurer que le libre-échange continental profite aux entreprises du continent plutôt qu'aux grandes filiales des entreprises multinationales. La majorité des entreprises nationales des pays les moins avancés africains sont des micros, des petites et des moyennes entreprises. Souvent, elles ne parviennent pas à moderniser leur production ni à réaliser des économies d'échelle ou à opérer simultanément sur plusieurs marchés. Elles ne peuvent donc pas tirer profit de marchés plus importants. C'est pourquoi les décideurs politiques doivent adopter des politiques qui favorisent les entreprises dynamiques, les soutenant dans l'amélioration de leurs produits, de leurs technologies, pour qu'alors elles puissent en effet tirer profit des opportunités du marché. Enfin, pour permettre aux PMA africains d'être compétitifs sur des marchés libéralisés, les règles d'origine de l'accord continental doivent être très bien élaborées et bien mises en œuvre. Mesdames et messieurs, la crise du Covid-19 a évidemment gravement affecté le commerce international. On a vu toutes les restrictions d'exportation qui ont été extrêmement pénibles à supporter pour un bon nombre des PMA. Nous devons donc relancer le commerce le plus rapidement possible afin de l'utiliser cette fois comme un moteur de croissance inclusive et soutenable. La CNUSET estime que la crise du Covid-19 actuelle risque de réduire le PIB des économies africaines de 1,4 Les petites économies pourraient connaître des contractions allant jusqu'à 7,8 Et cette contraction est principalement due à une réduction des exportations de matières premières et à des pertes de recettes fiscales, ce qui évidemment réduit la capacité des gouvernements à répondre à la crise. Donc, la seule libéralisation du commerce ne fera pas automatiquement de l'accord de libre-échange un succès, qui, au contraire, en l'absence de politique active, pourrait même générer des perdants. C'est pourquoi l'accord de libre-échange nécessite des choix politiques et des politiques très actives. Cet accord de libre-échange prévoit que la libéralisation du commerce se fera progressivement, en particulier pour les PMA. Et cela devrait donner au gouvernement des PMA africains le temps de, se mettre en, de mettre en œuvre des politiques qui développent les capacités productives nationales et l'entrepreneuriat en vue de transformer progressivement leurs économies et de les rendre prêtes, je dirais, à cette ouverture. Ce n'est que de cette manière que les entreprises africaines pourront exploiter les possibilités de croissance dans les chaînes de valeur régionales et mondiales. Le renforcement des capacités productives n'est jamais une tâche facile, mais en tout cas, au nom de la CNU7, je peux assurer les pays les moins avancés africains, que nous, serons, nous sommes et nous serons à vos côtés pour vous accompagner dans cette voie de renforcement des capacités productives. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup Isabelle pour cette présentation sur la position des PMA dans le commerce mondial, mais aussi également sur le continent. Euh, donc, euh, une position très, très difficile que vous venez de présenter avec des chiffres à l'appui, mais également, vous avez fait part euh, des conditions nécessaires qu'il faudra mettre en place pour que les PMA puissent, en fait, changer drastiquement de position et d'avancer dans le contexte de l'accord de libre-échange qui va nécessiter, comme vous avez dit, des choix de politique très actifs de la part des gouvernements euh, des PMA. Donc, uh, I see that we, ha we have uh, um, uh, Honorable Minister Paul Molapo, the Minister of Trade and Industry, uh, Lesotho. Um, Minister, uh, do you hear me? Dr. Uh, Molapo. No, I think yes, maybe. now I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, uh, now you we hear, me? hear you. Yes, we hear you. We hear you and we see you. And uh, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Minister, um, for being with us. And um, 
We, we started uh, with uh, uh, Ms. Isabel Durand, the Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD. And um, I'm going to give you now uh, uh, the floor. Um, you are going to share with us the experience of Lesotho's in participating in international trade and the role of uh, international trade in driving uh, Lesotho's uh, national development and divorce. You will also share the challenges faced uh, by your country, lessons learned, and best practices to further integrate into regional and global trade. Um, the floor is yours, um, Dr. Malapo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the inconvenience. We have a problem here of the disconnection. I was not able, the first I could hear, I could see you and hear you, but I could realize you are not hearing what I was saying. Anyway, moderator, Miss Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, let me thank the organizers of this event for giving me an opportunity to participate as a panelist and to share our views and issues that affect least developed countries especially those that are trade related. As we continue to be faced with various structural challenges, which cut across economic and social issues. Moderator, the trade, especially international trade remains an important policy goal to achieve developmental aspiration for small economies like the Sutu. International trade has played a significant role in driving Lesotho's national development agenda that pursue export-led economic growth as encapsulated by the National Strategic Development Plan, the so-called NSDP2 in Lesotho. It is one of the key levers to getting Lesotho on a sustainable development path. It is for these reasons that we embark on the development of a comprehensive national trade policy together with the national trade strategy, also known as a national export strategy, which we launched in December, 2020. Further to this effort, we upgraded and relaunched in December, 2020, the Lesotho Trade Information Portal. These initiatives will enable Lesotho to contribute, to continue to participate meaningfully in the global trading laws, which resulted in the, small, in the Business Licensing and Reg Registration Act. This, maintain, exi this maintaining existing one, as well as to farewell in the, in the doing business rankings, which we, le we level the play, which will level the playing field for both domestic and foreign investors. Moderator Lesotho currently benefits from membership in various trade agreements under the auspices of the Southern African Custom Union, the so-called SACU, and the South African Development Community, SADC. In addition, the SUTU has also taken advantage of the non-reciprocal market access under the generalized system of preferred, including dispensation such as the African Growth and Opportunity Act, the AGUA. These trade agreements and arrangements have enabled the SUTU to participate in the global and regional value chains resulting in industrialization in certain sectors of the economy. Thousands of jobs have therefore been created and maintained. The recently launched African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCTA, provides additional market access opportunities. The aim is to empower micro, small, and medium enterprises to increase their share of trade as we 
drive to penetrate the African market by supplying goods and services to the rest of the continent. And we believe that this is at, uh, attainable. Moderator, the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement was agreed at an opportune time, just a little over two years after coming into effect of the Istanbul program of action, though implementation started in 2017. It has enabled us to realize the benefits brought by the same agreement. For instance, the SUTU has embarked on reform pertaining to cross border trade through, among others, implementation of coordinated border management, preferred trade system, the relaunch of the Lesotho Trade Information Portal for ease of doing business. This are meant to eliminate border inefficiencies and barriers, simplify rules and procedures, improve transparency, predictability and availability of information increase level of compliance, increase speed of which business transact and reduce cost of doing business. Despite progress made, there are challenges pertaining to undiversified export products and market. Our main export remain concentrated on a few products where value added need to be enhanced and these products are also destined to handful markets. Be that as it may, Lesotho is focusing on diversifying uh, goods and services and it is our fervent benefit uh, believe that in our case, increasing trade with other countries will lead to creation and maintenance of the much needed jobs, especially for the youth and women. Furthermore, to further mitigate this challenge, the government has developed policies geared towards diversification and putting in place structure, infrastructure that is required to support industrialization. This includes agriculture, mainly focusing on production of high value products and agro processing, manufacturing services such as tourism, creative industries, and technology and innovation. Lesotho, like other LCD, must overcome various challenges to graduate from the least developed countries status. These challenges include low productivity, capacity, inadequate trade-related infrastructures, including ICT, and other socioeconomic challenges, such as diseases, which impact on youth and active labor. And lately, the scourge of COVID-19 has exacerbated our vulnerability. To address some of these challenges, Lesotho is investing in requisite infrastructure in respect of, but not limited to standards and quality assurance energy, water, and trade facilities, as well as related services to enable rapid industrialization. As I conclude, it would be remnant of me not to refer to our current challenges of COVID-19 and its consequences, which have exerted a lot of pressure on our scarce resources. Resources that are being diverted to keep the spread of the pandemic and provide healthcare supplies. Moderator. Finally, moderator, it is important that LDC should have enough policy space to allow them to address their developmental needs and challenges that they are faced with. 
additional efforts are required by government in partnership with develop development partners to cope with the fast test paced uh, digital digitization and artificial intelligence that are dynamic to and diverse of the LDC. At this point, I would like to acknowledge the international part partners are playing part in our economies through provision of technical and financial support to assist our countries to address capacity constraint. And we are grateful for their support. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Molapo, for sharing the experience of uh, uh, Lesotho in uh, um, international trade, and especially uh, the, the strategy that the government has adopted, which is an export-led economic growth uh, strategy, the progress so far, um, but also uh, the challenges that we are uh, facing. But uh, it's uh, worth uh, to note the many uh, policy uh, strategies and measures that the government has put in place to enable Lesotho to implement its strategy around uh, export-led export economic growth. So um, I will uh, uh, move to the uh, next uh, speaker. So I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Radnakar Adhikari, Executive I'm Secretary. I'm sorry. For I'm sorry. We need the Minister from Malawi next, please. Um, sorry. Um, hello. Sorry, hello. If you could kindly give the floor to Honorable uh, Minister Gwengwe, please. Okay, thank you. But, uh, but my apologies to uh, Honorable Minister uh, Sosten Gwengwe. As, um, as the lead discussant, I was uh, going to ask him after all the panelists uh, speak um, to give uh, his uh, uh, remarks. But uh, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, Honorable Minister of Trade and Member of Parliament for Malawi as a lead discussant. And uh, uh, thank you. apologies for that. Thank you. Um, moderator, Ms. Um, Gino, Genove Beha, all protocols observed. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, the, the, the floor at this time uh, to make um, uh, my statement and my statement. As we are striving to build a strong and sustainable future, the COVID-19 pandemic presents a major obstacle in our quest to attain a favorable and competitive trading environment. The pandemic has in fact reversed some of the hard won government of gains and the ability to attain more. And the COVID-19 restrictions and measures such as lockdowns have slowed down economic activities and production networks, supply chains, and consumer spending have been disrupted, thereby affecting income inflows. Although this is the case, COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us to build resilience in embracing e-commerce with a lot of online trading taking place more than ever before. Following this, governments in cooperation with development partners need to come up with recovery measures to build back better. There is need to build resilient economies in order not to miss the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Agenda 2063. This meeting is being convened at an opportune time when the need for regional integration and enhancement of external trade cannot be overemphasized. 
The African Continental Free Trade Area demonstrates the eagerness by our governments to utilize regional integration as a tool for achieving favorable trade conditions and shared economic prosperity through structural transformation at continental level. The AFCFTA aims to boost intra-African trade by making Africa a single market of 1.2 billion people with a cumulative GDP of over 3.4 trillion. It is projected that uh, implementation of the agreement will increase intra-African trade by 52% by 2022, compared with trade levels of 2010, and the double share of intra-African trade can be around 18% of Africa's exports by the start of the next decade. It will also provide increased market access, which will enhance competitiveness of LDCs. Successful implementation of the AFCFTA presents great opportunity for LDCs to attain their development aspirations. However, to achieve the above, a lot needs to be done, most especially in infrastructure development. For us to benefit from the FCFTA and to, to attain the desired structure transformation, some fundamental factors ought to be met. Firstly, infrastructure remains a key constraint and a challenge to the LDCs in Africa. This has negatively affected cost of doing business and the competitiveness of African LDCs. Investment in sustainable infrastructure, in particular road, rail, and air transport, can serve as a foundation for economic development and growth. For land in countries like Malawi, investments in border infrastructure and corridor developments with our neighboring countries will further ensure delivery of developmental benefits over a long term. External trade is another key mechanism which can accelerate development and graduation of Africa LDCs by, among other things, widening our revenue bases and creating employment. Some of the ways to attain this will include one, development of regional and global value chains. Two, negotiating for preferential rules of origin. Three, diversification from primary commodities into value-added ones. Four, promotion of trade in services. Five, enhancing our productive capacities and commercialization and mechanization and production of e-trade as a tool for accessing global markets among others. We need to draw our attention to the above issues as we discuss how to enhance trade, build and maintain resilient infrastructure, and promote regional integration in African LDCs. There are many opportunities and challenges which we need to capitalize on and deal with respectfully to accelerate development in our economies. The developed partners within the WTO should further continue supporting LDCs with the necessary aid for trade programs, provision of capacity building, support towards implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement, in particular for those that have developed national trade facilitation action plans like Malawi. More preferential market access should be encouraged with a minimum or no non-tariff barriers for LDCs. Uh, lastly, let me thank the United Nations for organizing this very important review meeting despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I also look forward to hearing your contributions and charting together the next steps forward in order to strengthen the global partnerships and most importantly, address the developmental challenges in the LDCs. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Minister Nguegue for these uh, uh, remarks, especially uh, for highlighting the, the challenges of uh, uh, COVID-19 and impact of this pandemic on uh, LDCs uh, economies and uh, especially on trade. But at the same time, you did in fact highlight the opportunity that uh, the pandemic might have opened in terms of uh, uh, building uh, resilience and the opportunity to build uh, uh, back better. Thank you. Um, I will move now to um, our next uh, panelist, um, Mr. Ranaka Adikari. Um, he's the Executive Secretariat um, for the Enhanced Integrated Framework. Um, Mr. Adikari will share information on the aid for trade support to LDCs and the key success of uh, this initiative in building the trade capacity of uh, LDCs. He will also highlight how aid for trade effectiveness can be enhanced to support effective participation of LDCs in global and regional production chains, including the participation of women in international trade. Uh, Dr. Um, Adikari, you heard the previous uh, speakers, especially uh, the challenges that uh, LDCs are face in terms of uh, participating in global trade. And I think your presentation might address some of those issues. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Adikari. Uh, you are muted. Yes. 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 Here yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam uh, Moderator, uh, for providing this opportunity. Um, let me um, let me first of all wish you a uh, good good afternoon in Africa and Europe, and good morning in the Americas, including uh, USA and Haiti. Uh, and, and possibly if anybody is listening from Asia Pacific, a good evening. I would like to thank UNHOHRRLS and the government of Malawi for this opportunity. As you rightly pointed out, Madam Moderator, ministers have already highlighted those challenges. Those challenges are emanating from the fact that there's a huge uh, market failure that exists in the area of, uh, of uh, information policies in the area of procedure institutions and infrastructure that uh, need to be addressed in order to help uh, LDCs, particularly in Africa, compete effectively in the global economy. And this is the very rationale for the aid for trade. According to the latest OECD data, US dollar 140 billion has been dispersed in the form of aid for trade from 2006 to 2017. With US dollar 1.46, uh, uh, US dollar 146 billion going to Africa. There's a compelling evidence to suggest that in low income countries, including most LDCs in Africa and Haiti, $1 spent on aid for trade generates nearly US dollar 20 worth of exports. So that shows the kind of uh, effectiveness uh, and the impact at the, at the aggregate level. The Enhanced Integrated Framework, which, I, which was uh, established uh, in 2008, has been a key conduit for channeling aid for trade assistance to LDCs with a mission to ensure that LDCs are empowered to use trade and investment to integrate into global trade for sustainable development and poverty reduction. Most of our projects are co-financed by LDCs themselves or through contributions from other donors and private sector. This kind of approach is unique in international development community, but it guarantees that LDCs fully, fully own their own trade agenda. Allow me to highlight a few success, few examples of success. Through the EIF support over US dollar 1.5 billion of exports have been facilitated so far, and LDCs have been able to break into 122 
new international market. The EIF has contributed to the effective targeting of over US dollar 1.9 billion of aid for trade resources from development partners toward LDC's priorities as identified by the analytical work that EIF supports, which is known as Diagnostic Trade Integration Studies. Over 10,000 micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises have been supported to improve their participation in the strategic value chain. With our host country for this event, uh, Malawi leading uh, in, in some of these achievements, I just want to highlight two examples from Malawi. Through an innovative process for training smallholder growers of exports crop, the average income of participating groundnut farmers increased by 160% and those growing soya beans by 240%. Similarly, the Malawi Investment and Trade Center, MITC, helped facilitate over US dollar 70 million in new export orders and US dollar 350 million in investment deals through the EIF support. However, this vital channel of prosperity has suffered from COVID-19. With the kickoff of African continental free trade areas implementation, aid for trade, as ministers have also highlighted, would be crucial in assisting African LDCs to improve their capacity for implementation and take advantage of the market access opportunities. Now, let me come to the second point. Aid for trade has led to impactful results on the ground, particularly in the LDCs. However, this can be even more impactful and some elements are worth considering. Evidence-based analytical studies such as DTIS should be leveraged to ensure additional prioritization of resources to strengthen the sectors and value chain that have a greater, greatest potential for poverty reduction and inclusiveness. The empowerment of girls and women is one of the most effective tools for poverty eradication and sustainable development. However, the gender divide is even deeper in the LDCs. This calls for a greater streamlining of, uh, of the gender dimension in the aid for trade support. The EIF Empower Women Power Trade Initiative is supporting gender sensitive policies through the EIF country specific trade studies. Strategic support is also being directed to sectors in which women are predominantly engaged so that female owned businesses can expand and access new regional and global markets. As a result, currently 50% uh, of the EIF beneficiaries are women and this account for 80,000 women beneficiaries altogether. The donor coordination through mechanisms such as the EIF should be further exploited for targeted assistance and resource mobilization towards common priorities in LDC. Finally, considering the huge amount of investment required to recover from COVID-19 pandemic and to achieve what I call sustainable productive capacity, which cannot be made by public resources alone, attracting private investment, both domestic and foreign, would be critical to fill this gap. I can elaborate this point a little later uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you very much for your kind attention and providing me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Adhikari, especially in presenting um, the success stories with a specific example of uh, um, on uh, the aid for trade. Uh, support to, to the LDCs and the example of uh, uh, Malawi, since we have also the government uh, representative here from Malawi. So we still have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, four speakers, panelists, and um, I will ask to the panelists to stick really to the time because we have about uh, more than 100 participants uh, in order to give the opportunity to the participants to ask their questions and, uh, and engage with them. So um, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Towelani Renda Jerry, Head of uh, the Economic Integration, African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nirenda Jerry will discuss the role of infrastructure 
and highlight regional infrastructure development initiatives aimed at enhancing trade and deepening regional integration. She will also discuss the best practices for scaling up the necessary infrastructure to facilitate better integration, integrate and enhance their trade capacity of African LDCs. The floor is yours, uh, um, Dr. Tawela. Um, thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this event. So with your permission, Madam Moderator, we have submitted a statement, but in the interest of time, perhaps we'll just pick a few key points um, from that statement. Um, thank you. So to begin, yes. So to begin with, um, as the African Union's Development Agency, AUD and NEPAD uh, believes very strongly in the integrating role of connectivity and infrastructure to drive opportunities for sustainable economic growth um, on the continent. In 2010, African leaders launched the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, PIDA, as the overarching framework that would guide infrastructure implementation on the continent. PIDA is a long-term 30-year strategy set for implementation up to 2040, and it builds on previous infrastructure development efforts by bringing together under one umbrella, the four key sectors in infrastructure, which are energy, ICT, transport and water. And more importantly, PIDA is focused on large scale transboundary projects that would make an impact in deepening regional integration and enhancing trade. In the first PIDA Priority Action Plan, PIDA PAP1, which was set for implementation up to 2020, we had 51 cross-border programs, which were decomposed into over 400 individual projects. We are now moving into the second phase of PIDA, which is PIDA PAP2, which will be for implementation from 2020 to 2030. And we can report that of the 400 plus PIDA PAP1 projects that we worked on, close to 40% are either in operation or under construction, and at least 50% progressed in implementation from initial conceptualization to subsequent stages. PIDA projects have contributed more than 16,000 kilometers of road, at least 4,000 kilometers of rail, up to 3,500 kilometers of energy transmission line capacity, seven gigawatts of hydroelectricity generation, and have resulted in more than 40 countries being connected with regional fiber optic cables, as well as connectivity through internet exchange points. Over the last eight years of PIDA implementation, we have developed instruments and processes to guide infrastructure development, which are emerging as good practice to accelerate infrastructure development. And I will elaborate on a few of these. The first one, which is quite important, is the institutional architecture for infrastructure development in Africa, IADA which sets out very clearly the roles and responsibilities of key institutions and actors in Africa's infrastructure development. IADA provides a separation of roles and responsibilities between policy and political processes on the one hand and implementation processes on the other, while clearly defining the link between the two. A second um, instrument that we have developed is called the PIDA Service Delivery Mechanism, SDM, which is an instrument that has been developed by AUD and NEPAD to tackle the lack of technical capacity during the project preparation phase. The core purpose is to make Africa's cross-border infrastructure projects technically sound and economically feasible through advisory services that are facilitated and supported by AUD and NEPAD. In this way, the SDM is complementary to established project preparation funds, PPFs, as it acts as a feeder to the PPF project pipeline. In 2020, the SDM expert service pool became fully operational and worked on a pipeline of 89 projects of which 10 were provided with early stage advisory support. The PIDA quality label is another instrument that we have developed, which helps to certify excellence in project preparation and helps to ensure quality in all stages of the life cycle of regional infrastructure projects. And this is very important in terms of assuring um, investors on the soundness of uh, a project's preparation. 
you will agree with me that one of the intended outcomes of infrastructure development is to address issues of economic marginalization and social exclusion by facilitating the creation of economic opportunities and decent employment. And I think this has already been alluded to um, by other speakers as well. In that regard, AUD and EPA developed the PIDA Job Creation Toolkit to jumpstart a new era of African job creation by providing estimates of the jobs potential of infrastructure projects, policy options for maximizing jobs, and an analysis of skills required that could be used for skills planning and workforce development. The Presidential Infrastructure Champions Initiative, PICI, which was started under leadership of the South African Pre Presidency, is another tool that we use in infrastructure um, development. And what it is, is an opportunity for African heads of states and government to become actively involved in the development and implementation of regional and continental infrastructure projects. The champions bring visibility, help to unblock bottlenecks, coordinate resource mobilization, and provide leadership to ensure rapid project implementation. Currently, 11 heads of states are championing various infrastructure projects on the continent. Lastly, I want to mention Move Africa, which is an initiative that we started in anticipation of the continental free trade area with the idea of looking at the bottlenecks that exist at our various border posts um, and beginning to understand what those bottlenecks would be and how to then address them for the efficient movement of goods, peoples and services across borders. So drawing on the lessons of the last eight years, for the next phase Dr. of Peter, Excuse me, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tawela, can you try to wrap up? We still sure, have I'll move other on. speakers. Yes, okay. thank you. So I think the main thing to note is that in Peter Pub 2, we are focusing on corridor development, and that has already been alluded to, I think, as an important aspect of um, infrastructure development as far as facilitating trade. And what I would like to do maybe is just to end with some of the recommendations that we see as being necessary um, as we consider the next um, phase um, of the uh, successor to the instable plan of action. So the first thing I yes. think is that- um, what, we One need minute, to... Dr. Dr. Tawela, sure. sorry for interrupting, yeah. No problem. So we need to consider the build out of sustainable, resilient and high quality infrastructure. We need to ensure that corridor development is an integral part of our efforts at boosting intra-African trade. We also need to make sure that um, infrastructure is provisioned um, such that it is able to open up markets and enhance opportunities um, in our rural um, economies. And then we also have to work very closely with the private sector in terms of uh, mobilizing the requisite um, resources, but also ensuring that adequate resources are um, allocated for early stage um, project preparation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nirenda Jere, especially in presenting the achievements of, uh, of uh, PIDA and uh, the instruments and toolkits uh, that accompany um, the uh, PIDA, but also recommendations moving forward. Um, I will now move and give the floor to Ms. Emily Mburundoria, Director of Trade in Services and IP, African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Ms. Ndoria will enlighten us about uh, the AFCFTA and what opportunities it presents to African LDCs in the integrated into trade and value chains. She will also highlight the necessary prerequisites for the LDCs to effectively benefit from the new agreement and the needed support for the effective um, participation. So, um, Ms. Andoria, you have the floor, and we already heard from the other also um, speakers about the African uh, uh, Free uh, Trade Area Agreement and the opportunities that it could offer to uh, LDCs. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting the AFCFTA Secretary to participate in this uh, uh, meeting, as, you, as has been mentioned, and uh, we all know LDC, the African continent has the highest number of LDCs, and so for us, the work that we are undertaking under the AFCFTA 
will be instrumental in lifting a number of uh, LDCs uh, 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 to maybe, as uh, has been mentioned by the uh, Honorable Minister, to graduate from being LDCs. And uh, moving on, uh, as you may all recall, 1st January 2021 was a very historic day for uh, the continent of Africa and uh, the diaspora at large. And this is because on the 1st of January, the AFCFTA launched the start of trading. And uh, these, we believe, took us a step closer to the vision of having a more integrated um, uh, African continent. And uh, of course, we can actually say that uh, this action, it put towards actually the action of being able to achieve Agenda 2063 of the AU to have the African that we want. And uh, we take it that um, with the start of trading, it's now our obligation to ensure that the 1.3 or so billion Africans and the next generation should benefit from the AFCFTA if we effectively uh, implement it. And uh, as of now, maybe just to put a highlight on uh, where we are at, we have uh, 54 of the 55 uh, member states of the AU that are signatories to the AFCFTA agreement. And of that number, we have 36 countries that are now state parties that have deposited the instruments of ratification. And uh, it's good to see that uh, uh, the meeting is uh, being held uh, uh, virtually, but it is uh, being hosted by the uh, Republic of Malawi whereby the Republic of Malawi and uh, Zambia were the, are the latest to have ratified uh, uh, this year. And so part of what we are working on is to ensure that we have more AU member states ratifying to an extent that as mandated by the assembly that all uh, members are signatories and have ratified um, uh, their agreement to become state parties to their agreement. Now, Moving on to LDCs and basically all African countries, one of the biggest challenges that uh, there is a high reliance on uh, exports of primary commodities. And this has been highlighted in very many um, uh, studies and uh, traditionally also focusing on the markets of the North and not really um, uh, uh, looking at markets in the continent. And, Actually, part of what we fundamentally hope to do with the AFCFTA is that um, it, with its implementation, we can actually harness it as a, as a tool for fundamental structural transformation of Africa's economy and actually place Africa on the long-term industrial um, uh, development. And as you've heard also from my colleague from uh, Auda Nepad, infrastructure development is definitely key to ensure that we take care of both uh, the hard and the softer infrastructure to be able to industrialize in Africa and therefore boost intra-African trade and enhance our manufacturing. And here we're talking about really having more trade in value added uh, 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 products. If we go by the estimates that have been given by the World Bank that by uh, 2035, with the implementation of the AFCFTA agreement, we should see um, a lifting of additional 30 million people from extreme poverty and about 68 million people from moderate poverty, and also have a real income gains from the full implementation of the agreement, which will lead to an increase of 7%, or let's say uh, nearly US dollars, 450 billion. And uh, as we are talking about LDCs, it is clear that this would be an instrumental tool for uh, LDCs to actually get out of um, uh, poverty and actually graduate uh, uh, from being LDCs. So this uh, agreement actually does provide an anchor for long-term reform and integration, especially during this period uh, uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the consequences uh, that it has caused to most um, uh, economies. So we can actually use the AFCFTA um, uh, as a tool for us to be able to move from poverty uh, being our LDC countries. 
And it's also estimated that the volume of uh, total exports, and um, here we'll look at it from uh, the intracontinental exports will increase from, uh, by more than 81%. And also Afri non, uh, African exports to non-African ex exports, well, and non-African countries will also rise by about 19%. And in total, we'll see an increase of about 29% uh, uh, of, our, um, uh, of exports relative to our uh, business as usual or current uh, figures that we have. So this just provides us a snapshot of what uh, the AFCFTA agreement can actually do for the um, for those that are state parties to the agreement, which of course then uh, includes um, uh, a number of LDCs or the majority of LDCs, and it will also create new opportunities um, uh, for the manufacturers and workers that um, uh, have invested uh, in uh, in Africa. If we look at uh, what the agreement uh, hopes to do, and in this case, I'll talk about it in terms of um, uh, the current uh, situation whereby we have negotiated are, and are still negotiating um, uh, the liberalization of- Ms. Doria, may I ask you to try to wrap up with uh, this very good presentation? Okay. So we hope that the decrease in uh, tariffs and elimination of barriers to trade in services will be instrumental in gaining um, uh, or achieving the gains that we want to see with uh, that I have mentioned uh, earlier. And here the African countries have collectively undertaken uh, uh, to, com uh, to commit to liberalize substantially all trade by looking at about 97% of tariff lines that are to be eliminated. And here there is preference, of course, that has been given to LDCs that they would have about 10 years to eliminate 90% uh, um, of, uh, of the tariff lines and about 15 years to eliminate the remaining 70% of what we call uh, uh, sensitive products and exclusion uh, list of 3% of what they feel uh, uh, they still want to keep. And when we look at the commitments that have been done so far, we can see that about 75% uh, uh, of the African Union membership has actually given uh, 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 their offers. And this includes uh, uh, some customs uh, union and that's uh, the East African community, CEMAC and also uh, uh, echo us. So just in a nutshell, we can say that for us to be able to uh, participate uh, in the development of regional value chains and also to integrate into uh, the global value chains, we need not only to reduce tariffs, but also to ensure that there is trade facilitation instruments that uh, help in lowering our trade uh, our costs and reducing non-tariff barriers. And as I mentioned earlier, improving the hard and soft. Thank you, very much, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Ndoria, for this uh, uh, comprehensive presentation of the African CFTA, and especially in terms of opportunities that it offers to LDCs in terms of um, uh, improving actually its uh, uh, trade, in regional trade, but also how it can enter the global uh, value chains. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, uh, Mr. Tafkir Rahman, head of the LDC unit in the development division of uh, the WTO. And uh, Mr. Rahman will discuss uh, uh, trade preferences and other WTO related concessions afforded to the LDCs and how these have helped to increase LDCs uh, trade share. He will also highlight uh, how can this be further leveraged to support LDC's participation in international trade and their post-COVID-19 recovery. So as uh, the WTO prepares for the 12th ministerial conference, Mr. Rahman will also apprise us on how the conference can contribute to enhancing LDC's participation in uh, uh, global trade. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Rahman. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And it's a privilege to be part of this distinguished panel. 
uh, all protocols observed, let me move on to highlight a few points. Probably I will repeat and, and reiterate some of the points that have already been made. Uh, first of all, uh, 26 of the 33 LDCs uh, in Africa are WTO members, and six are in the accession process. So we have welcomed one LDC Liberia uh, during the last decade. Since 2011, WTO has had three major ministerial conferences which have adopted a set of concrete decisions for LDCs. Uh, this include duty-free quota-free market access, preferential rules of origin, LDC services waiver. And there have been incremental progress uh, in all these areas to, to facilitate uh, exports from LDCs. Uh, we have seen greater duty-free quota-free coverage, improved transparency of uh, preferential rules of origin, dedicated discussions of LDC services waiver. But there still remains scope for improvements in the implementation of these decisions. But the fundamental question remains that of the ability of LDCs to gain uh, from these opportunities. Other than the LDC specific decisions, the IPOA implementation has also been marked with a number of important agreements in the WTO. And I think Minister Molapo of Lesotho and Minister Guangwe from Malawi have mentioned about the trade facilitation agreement. Uh, over 80% of African LDC WTO members have already ratified the uh, trade facilitation agreement. When we talk about preferential schemes, uh, these preferential schemes often go underutilized for a variety of reasons. Mostly either the exported products face low MFN duty or even are MFN duty free, or certain markets have specific schemes such as AGOA. Nearly 80% of uh, exports uh, are primary commodities and hence the relevance of preferential rules of origin is somewhat limited for certain LDCs. And the crude fact is that the LDC services waiver has so far not been able to create commercial opportunities for LDC services and service supplier. As a result, the share of LDCs in global trade has not seen any discernible improvement over the last decade. The share of African LDCs in world merchandise exports declined from 0.69% in 2011 to 0.57% in 2019. The share of African LDCs in world commercial services exports stood at 0.38% in 2019, only slightly above 0.34% in 2011. And the dominant exporters in the African region are concentrated in a few LDCs, such as Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda. Some of the stylized facts of LDCs, like inadequate productive capacity, which Acting Under Secretary General Ms. Durant has emphasized, as well as the undiversified export structure, these are more acute in LDCs in Africa. The top three exporters in the group are either fuel or non-fuel mineral exporters, namely Angola, Democratic Republic, and Congo, and Zambia. And only a handful of LDCs like Lesotho and Madagascar can be considered manufacturing exporting LDCs. The African region also has its share in LDC graduation. Equatorial Guinea graduated from LDC status in 2017. Angola is in the process with extended time frame recently approved by the UNGA. Another LDC having observer status in the WTO, South Oman Principe is also on the graduation path. And with a quarter of LDCs in the graduation process, the next decade should indeed explore measures for sustainable graduation. Now, we all know that the year 2020, that is the last year of the IPOA implementation, has met the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. And this has badly hit the LDCs, which already had a, a subdued trade performance in 2019. And there has been a particular slump of services exports, which continue to remain depressed since the second quarter of 2020. And just to highlight that the first three quarters of 2020, merchandise exports of African LDCs dropped by around 18% year on year compared to 11% at the world level. Of course, there are individual variations uh, as far as uh, the LDCs are concerned. Now, there have been some recovery, but that recovery is fragile because incidence of COVID-19 is reported around the world, and there remains a great deal of uncertainty about the prospects of trade in the coming months. Now, this, regarding the WTO ministerial conference, and we are having a meeting when only this morning, 
the WTO members informally discuss the date and venue of the next ministerial conference. And in all likelihood, there will be a formal decision taken uh, next week. But in all likelihood, the ministerial is going to take place in the beginning of December and in, in Geneva. So hopefully we'll be able to feed LDC-5 with, with results of the review of the multilateral trading system. Now, with regard to deliverables, first and foremost, priority is to conclude the fishery subsidy negotiation. It was launched in Doha negotiations and got impetus in recent years, but we were unable to conclude the negotiations by 2020, which was also an SDG goal reflected in 14.6. The negotiations are seeking to contribute to sustainable fisheries, where the LDCs are trying to ensure an agreement which contributes to the preservation of their fish stock and development of their small scale and artisanal fishing sector. Agriculture negotiations have been another priority, in particular, the reform of the global domestic subsidy rules. And importantly, the food security ob objectives are in, in, informing these negotiations. As you all know, one specific outcome was related to food stock holding programs of developing countries. And there are a number of other issues linked to food security concerns, including special safeguard mechanism or export restrictions on food stuff. I have to say that the LDCs from this region are actively participating in this discussion. Cotton is another important dossier which has received special attention in the WTO. In fact, WTO is having Cotton Day celebrations every year focusing on both trade and development aspects. And we have Mr. had Rahman. more than 30 rounds of consultations. Mr. Rahman. Another important area is the pursuit of SND negotiations, which the LDCs are pursuing. And Mr. The Rahman, may, may I ask you to try to wrap up? Thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm wrapping up in next one minute. Mm -hmm. What we are also seeing in the WTO that in addition to this multilateral process, uh, we have uh, some joint sector initiatives, which are also moving in parallel and a number of LDCs are also participating in it. There is critical mass in these processes. So LDCs need to see how they can identify their interest, weigh the merits of this process and explore measures. WTO members, as of today, have not drawn up possible elements or contours of an MC12 outcome. Given the time available and complexity of working format due to the ongoing pandemic, perhaps all will have to modulate or adapt their ambitions. Finally, I have to mention this, our new DG, Dr. Angozi Okonza-Avala, the first African and the first woman to lead the WTO will assume office next Monday. She very much subscribes to the view that WTO provides essential support to help developing countries and LDCs recover from the pandemic, as well as support the mission of inclusive growth and sustainable development, including to trade. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I will respond if there's any questions later. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Rahman, and uh, especially with uh, your last sentence regarding uh, um, your new executive director and hopefully with uh, the objective of ensuring that WTO will support sustainable development and uh, inclusive uh, uh, global economy, I may say this way, but thank you for your presentation. And we took note on the fact that there have been some incremental progress, but there's still a uh, large scope for improvement. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, interesting that is uh, before I give the floor to uh, Miss Louise uh, Wiget, I think that uh, across uh, uh, the presentations that we we heard, there is this recurrent um, issues in terms of uh, the the major challenges basically related to inadequate productive capacities and uh, undiversified um, exports. And uh, since uh, uh, Ms. Louise Wiggett, Chief Executive Officer, Global Trade Solution, uh, is here as a, a private sector representative, um, we hope that you'll be able to address some of these uh, uh, issues in terms of solutions. Uh, Ms. Wiggett will uh, highlight opportunities for the private sector, uh, in particular for the macro, small, and medium enterprises in the uh, African CFTA and uh, what key elements are necessary to enhance their participation in international trade, including in uh, regional trade. Uh, should we also highlight how we can ensure that landlocked LDCs 
are not left behind and are integrated into the regional and the global trade. So uh, she will present her views on the role of the private sector in the new program of action for LDCs and in the COVID-19 recovery efforts for LDCs, um, by LDCs. And um, when we speak of the private sector, usually challenges are opportunities for the private sector. The floor is yours, uh, Ms. Wiggett. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moderator. I really appreciate your kind words. Um, it's normally difficult to come from a private sector perspective because our views are so different and our worlds are so different. I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me onto this um, very distinguished panels. And um, I'm hopefully gonna stick to the five minutes allocated to me because I know you're running short on time. So I think um, Emily has really set the scene for me because the Africa Free Trade Agreement creates the largest free trade area in the world measured by number of countries participating. What is even more staggering is the fact that the PAC connects 1.3 billion people across 55 countries with a gross uh, combined gross domestic product of um, 3.4 trillion US dollars. So um, what we've realized from a private sector perspective and also from LDC perspective is that the opportunity for Africa to trade with Africa is actually immense. And why do we really have to worry with all the regulations and all the requirements to get things very far away from us when we can actually really trade right on our doorstep? The counter to that is really that the regional development um, and the availability of um, information on the continent in terms of complying with all the regulatory frameworks are really limiting. And that is really the area where we see a huge opportunity to participate with organizations like um, UNTAC, um, WTO, and also w WCO to make um, trade-related information more available, um, specifically to small, medium enterprises and women um, um, entrepreneurs, because that is really the heartbeat of the growth of trade in Africa. Um, the, Emily also quoted the figure that the potential exists, according to the World Bank, to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty if we use the Africa Free Trade Agreement to our, its full potential. And also with the COVID pandemic, it has really created opportunities for um, uh, the, the people in Africa because um, most countries are beginning to look at multi-sourcing. They are very um, worried um, about the fact that um, you had single sourcing. Um, if that country goes into lockdown or the borders gets closed, you really have a big problem. And I think um, the opportunity is being created within the African continent to step into that role, um, to be able to provide some of the products and to fill that gap, to be able to allow for multi-sourcing. Some of the initiatives that we've really been seeing um, going forward and particularly this is actually Women's Week in Africa. We kicked off with the Women in Africa conference on Saturday night. Yesterday, we had a Women in Trade conference um, um, with um, UNECA, where we um, discussed policy reforms and the fact that women must really um, use the power that's been given to them um, under the Africa Free Trade Agreement and make their voices heard. To that extent, I must also um, congratulate Ms. Durant for her recent appointment. Um, we are really making uh, or planting our flag now. So it's not only at the WTO, but it's also at UNTAC. We have got a lady um, at the top, and I think it is about time. So from the ICC perspective, um, there's been a lot of work done um, on the continent particularly with the ICC program of SAFE, the um, MSMEs, the call to action program that was launched last year and continuing in this year. Also tomorrow, we are launching the 5,000 digitization program um, under the banner of the ICC to really focus on women entrepreneurs and on and micro and, and small medium enterprises. And then also very exciting is the Trade Forward program that the UK Prosper Prosperity Fund is, has already launched with a particular focus on women. 
the main aim is that we really need to um, work together. We need to get the information out of the, out there and we need to break down the barriers that exist for the small and medium enterprises to, to flourish. Um, very often we hear the word that it's funding that's the problem. My belief and what we've um, also picked up through research, it's very often not funding that is the biggest problem. It's information. You know, what do I do? What is the rules and regulations? How do I go about it? And it's not always um, available at your fingertips. And sometimes it's very costly to get that information. And very often you get the wrong information. So some very good work being done by the ICC, also the UK Prosperity Fund with the Trade Forward Programme. I think also what is important is the development of the trade corridors. We've got two main projects in terms of um, corridor management um, and trade management, both in the EAC and within the SADC region. The hope is that we can get these two programs to link up together, that we don't have to replicate information again. Um, and then within the custom space within the continent, there is some very exciting modernization programs, two which I would like to mention close to my heart within the Saka region. We are busy with a regional AO program um, and with a particular focus on small, medium enterprises, which was really good because when we engage with the customs authorities, we identified the need that small and medium enterprises actually cannot comply with all the regulations and the compliance requirements under a normal AEO program, and that we should develop a special um, recipe for the SMEs to enable them to also get the benefits under our AEO program. So I'm very glad to say that um, this policy or this approach has been adop adopted within the soccer region, and we're working very hard to have the program ready um, by the middle of this year and make it available to the small and medium enterprises. Also very exciting development on the continent and um, in the region has been the rise of e-commerce and the adoption of e-commerce. So I need to reach out to our colleagues at the WTO and say, can we please get our e-commerce discussions concluded? It has been going on for too long. And we need um, um, certainty in that market segment to know what we're dealing with and how we're going to go about it, because it is, has probably got the biggest opportunity for us to develop. And strangely enough, e-commerce is gen gender neutral. You don't know who sits behind the platform and it breaks down all the gender barriers that we're so used to and that create such a lot of problems. And you don't know. It can be any e-commerce site for all you know. For all you know, there is a, a very powerful lady sitting behind it. What's also been quite exciting is the development of new markets. And coincidentally, I don't know if the minister from Lesotho is still on the line. The particular example that I want to use there is the development of the cannabis um, market in Lesotho. Again, it's a brand new market segment. It's not only in Lesotho, but uh, very much within the region. But the problem here is, and this is something that we're going to have to address, it's very much aimed and uh, applicable to the SME market and also the, the um, female entrepreneurs. But the legislative um, um, environment around this is very um, in a very infancy stage. And we need to, again, make an appeal that we can get the legislative framework finalized that we can operate within an environment of certainty. So I hope that's given you a little bit of um, hope and, and a perspective from the um, uh, SME um, and the trade perspective, and I'm welcome to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Ms. Moderator. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Wiggett, for this uh, uh, presentation, uh, especially um, as uh, other speakers with regard to the African CFTA in terms of uh, opportunities. But you also spoke about um, uh, breaking the barriers for SME. And this time it's not about money, it's not about funding, but it's about access to information with a special plea to the institutions around the table, ANCTA, WTO, WTO to uh, really uh, make information available to, to SMEs and the initiatives that are ongoing. So um, we have actually uh, um, uh, down the round of the panelists 
And um, uh, I would like to thank the panelists for really their presentations. We have about uh, um, 15 minutes for uh, a Q&A. And um, just to remind uh, participants that uh, um, if you want to um, uh, share a perspective or um, ask a question, um, you have the chat. And uh, for a specific question that needs uh, a response, you have the Q&A. Um, so, so far I have um, uh, one question, one specific uh, Q&A. And uh, the q and is, is it's about, uh, it's for WTO. And uh, the question is, uh, what are the prospects uh, for the renewal of TRIPS extension uh, for LDCs? Um, Mr. Rahman. You are muted. You had a specific question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I think I have a specific question with regard to the TRIPS extension uh, decision uh, that uh, is going to be considered. Um, as you all know, that uh, in the area of TRIPS, there are two types of extensions that are available for LDCs. We, one is called a general extension. And there's another one which relates to extension for patent protection for pharmaceutical products. So the general uh, TRIPS extension is coming up for a renewal. It will expire in July this year. And uh, the WTO LDC group has submitted a proposal where they are, whereby they are seeking two elements. One is that they want to be exempted from TRIPS obligation as long as they remain in LDC. And they also want some extended time frame for the graduating LDCs. This, uh, this matter is now being seized uh, in the TRIPS Council. Uh, it is uh, being discussed. And hopefully, uh, there will be a decision by July. Maybe the negotiating variable is the number of years um, that this will be considered for, for LDCs. Normally, you, you have a number of years because extensions of transition period is time bound. So members are negotiating a time frame for the extension of this TRIPS transition period. So um, as of today, negotiations are ongoing um, and the discussions are happening in the TRIPS Council. And, and hopefully, as has been in the past, uh, that uh, since the adoption of the TRIPS agreement in 1995, the LDCs have been uh, considered sympathetically by WTO members, and hopefully another extension will come by July. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Rahman. Um, I would like also to uh, acknowledge um, Ms. Christina uh, Zakeo, the Principal Secretary, Ministry of Trade, um, who is uh, the chair of uh, the session in case uh, there are also some questions that need to be answered, but also um, uh, Madam Chair, um, in case you would like to um, uh, come in and uh, uh, comment on the, on the discussions. Um, there is uh, um, also in the, we have uh, um, in the chat, um, I don't see any uh, specific uh, uh, question. Uh, Madam Moderator, if you allow me, there's another question addressed to WTO on SND. Should I address it now? A specific question? Uh, you have, please do, but uh, if you can say it in one, maximum two minutes. Okay, so uh, it's uh, uh, very clear that the ministerial process has not yet started, hopefully next week, the MC12 process will begin. Um, the SND negotiation has been part of a Doha round uh, since 2001, and it is an important file for the developing countries and LDCs. LDCs are pursuing this negotiation under the umbrella of the G90 group in the WTO. Uh, 10 proposals have been tabled, and uh, this is the work is continuing in the under the ages of the Committee on Trade and Development special session. 
But whether we will have a deliverable or an outcome as part of MC12, for this, we will have to see uh, as the ministerial process begins, uh, hopefully sometime next week, um, because it's not straightforward. As, uh, as I said, uh, what should be part of the contours of an MC12 package? Members have not yet come to that point. But independently, this work is continuing under the umbrella of the city DSS. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Taufik. Um, I don't see any, um, any question or comment uh, from the chat box. Um, may, may I take actually this uh, opportunity as uh, the moderator since there are no questions around. Madam Chair, if you allow me um, to give in fact the opportunity uh, uh, today to uh, the panelists um, as they have heard uh, the different uh, presentations uh, uh, starting from um, the experience uh, of Lesotho, the practical experience of Lesotho in terms of uh, the uh, strategy that is based uh, on export-led uh, growth uh, strategy. We heard also from ENCTAD the, the, the challenges that uh, the least developed countries are facing in terms of uh, um, global competitiveness, but also um, challenges related to uh, productivity. And uh, we also heard the other speakers um, talking about uh, uh, more or less uh, the same issues with regard to the position of the LDCs in the, in the global economy and um, their uh, very limited integration to the uh, global value chains. Uh, but also in terms of uh, the trade instruments that are in place, but uh, which are very difficult in terms of uh, the ability and capability of the LDCs to leverage these uh, instruments and the different initiatives and programs in place. Um, I would like to ask uh, whether some of the panelists have um, uh, maybe a round of the panelists, uh, a final uh, word on uh, on this uh, on this uh, pub, not final word but the final thought on the on these presentations so um i will start by uh, uh, isabelle durand uh, who spoke first yeah. voilà. yes thank you uh, giovanni um, and of course i acknowledge um, the very useful efforts and initiative which were presented by by the different speakers before me or after me <laughs> explaining what was done in Lesotho and other countries in order to support uh, uh, the, the a kind of diversification and support to the, to the SMEs and, and companies on, on national level. I just want to insist on one aspect uh, that I find really key uh, for the next periods and especially waiting for uh, the, the, the implementation of the African free trade area for uh, uh, LDCs. What I said about infrastructure is for me totally key because the question of electricity, the question of infrastructure related to I, uh, uh, the, the ICT are really efforts that sometimes it could be perceived and I understand that very well that in the LDCs the priorities are so, uh, um, so numerous that when you have to, to prioritize different things. And sometimes it appears that social priorities are the most important. But I feel that in, in related to trade, if you really would like that trade could really become a, a tool for development, it means that investment in innovation, in uh, ITC, but also in infrastructure is totally key to support um, the, the SMEs or the companies in your country, and especially to support the capacity of those countries to grow and not only to be limited to small scale and, and really very limited effect on the economy globally. So I just wanted to insist on that because it appears a little bit something that we are doing after when the other things are done. It's not true. It has to be done from the beginning because the new wave of uh, um, technological development. And I, I just insist on the fact that we published yesterday a new report on technology and innovation and inequalities. 
and the, the, the LDCs are left behind. And if they are not in the new wave of technology, they will be lost for trade, especially in spouses. So I, 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 I allow me to insist on that, but uh, thank that you. last word. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Um, I will go around very quickly and I will ask each panelist one minute, one word, uh, one takeaway. Um, I will ask now Mr. Adhikari. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Isabel has already spoken what I wanted to speak in relation to e-commerce or digital trade. But then within that, there are three elements that are critical for African LDCs and they relate to infrastructure, skill and policies. Well, there can be um, a lot of other programs supporting policies and skill. We are also supporting them and having conducted already supported nine uh, such e-trade readiness assessment, uh, uh, which Angtad did uh, for, uh, in, on our behalf in, in nine LDCs. We have a wealth of experience that we can share. But, one minute, but, thank you. But one minute, I want to uh, emphasize- One on word, one investment. word. Sorry, managing the time here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So investment that is required for infrastructure purpose can be mobilized through uh, private sector support, either yeah. through foreign direct investment or blended financing. Thank you, Mr. Dikari. So, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to give the time to- Everybody, one word, everybody. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nirenda Jerry, one word. Um, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. So I would say that in addition to hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, we need to consider investments in the breadth of integration through market access and trade and the depth of integration as in looking at integration beyond trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will do the wrong because I want to give the final word to His uh, Excellency uh, uh, Paul Molapo, the Minister of Trade and Industry of Lesotho. So very quickly, now I'm going to um, uh, Ms. Emily Burundoria. Okay, thank you very much. And I think for me, it's just also a source of information and to say, uh, that uh, we are also negotiating a protocol on investment, a protocol on e-commerce, and also a protocol in, on intellectual property rights in this second uh, uh, phase of the negotiations. So we look forward to handling most of the issues that have been mentioned and highlighted. And we also do look forward to work closely with ANCTAD in this uh, uh, in this work moving forward. So we are in it together. And uh, and also maybe lastly- Thank so you. Thank you, Madam Doria. Is the protocol on uh, women in trade. Protocol thank on- Thank you very much. Okay, thank you I'm very much. I'm being ruthless, but time is a uh, person. <laughs> now I'm going to uh, Mr. Rahman. One word, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I think I want to highlight one point that major multilateral work in the WTO is about improvement of rules or, uh, to, to level the playing field. But the main impetus, and I think as I, I will echo the word of uh, Madame Durant, is that it has to be trade capacity building because there has been very little qualitative change in LDC trade over the last decade. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rahman, Mr. Rahman. Uh, Madame Louise uh, Wigget. Well, I'm going to keep it to one word. Um, I think technology innovation is the way to go. Um, things like blockchain technology is critical. It can change our world immensely. And I think that's where we should focus. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to use the wheel that's there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Wigget. We finally heard uh, about blockchain in the, in the session <laughs> towards the end. I think I've done the tour of... Uh, all panelists, I didn't forget anyone. I would like to give the um, opportunity to um, uh, uh, the Minister, Dr. Uh, Molapo, Minister of Trade and Industry of Lesotho um, for his uh, uh, final uh, thoughts on these, uh, on these discussions. Um, Dr. Molapo. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And thank you to all the, the panelists for the discussion and all whatever they said has been an eye-opening. 
Uh, what, what we could say here is let me first indicate that the Africa usually face productive capacity constraint. It is therefore important for government and development partners to support and enhance all productive sectors of the economy to address these challenges through building, up, uh, upgrading, and modernizing trade related infrastructure relating for instance, to standards and quality, energy, mm -hmm. communication, transport, and logistics. Secondly, we should focus on trade in services, particularly ICT, to assist LDDC to be creative such that we can also participate in technological innovations and close the current technological or digital divide to meet our development, developmental needs. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all uh, uh, panelists for your insightful uh, uh, presentations and your perspectives on um, enhancing external trade for African LDCs, infrastructure development, and the role of uh, uh, regional integration. Um, we, we have heard a lot of challenges. Um, it's sobering also uh, to see that uh, there has been, uh, I would say, very little progress from what we heard from many panelists. But at the same time, despite um, the challenges uh, of uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, we also heard that um, there are opportunities. Opportunities uh, first with the uh, CFTA, uh, in terms of this, uh, this market, uh, the African market. There are opportunities in terms of uh, how we can uh, leverage the existing uh, instruments. There are also opportunities um, in terms of uh, um, the road. I mean, the road that uh, the, the different countries still have to, uh, to travel. As uh, we had some um, a representative, Ms. Wigget, from the private sector, uh, it was very clear that uh, for small and medium enterprises, it's not an issue of uh, funding, but uh, also an issue of uh, access uh, to information. It was also uh, good to hear that uh, with COVID, um, e-commerce became uh, actually a great opportunity and some countries have already, in fact, uh, uh, started to take advantage of this opportunity. But at the same time, it's very clear that there is a, a long way to go, both in terms of uh, increasing productivity, in terms of uh, export diversification, and most importantly, in terms of uh, uh, filling the gap in uh, infrastructure to strengthen actually both regional integration, but also the position of LDCs in the global economy and making trade the engine of growth for development and uh, the SDGs. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Madam uh, uh, Christina Zakeo, um, for this opportunity to moderate uh, this uh, uh, session uh, with uh, these um, uh, excellent uh, panelists. And um, I am uh, uh, concluding uh, uh, this uh, uh, session as uh, we have uh, heard from everybody. And uh, we had actually about 101 participants. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, uh, goodbye to all. Bon après-midi, bonne soirée ou bonne journée.